everybody. Uh, this is going to be some more multiple choice for your AP uh, stat uh, test coming up. So construct a 90% confidence interval for the population mean mu, assuming that the population has normal distribution and the sample of 15 randomly selected students has a GPA of 2.86 with standard deviation of uh, 0.78. So we're going to construct a 90% confidence interval. Okay, so this is my mean. Remember, here's your confidence interval formula right here. So also you can do this in your calculator also. So, so my mean is the 2.86 and then my Z star, you guys, your Z star at a 90% confidence interval. Remember, if we're doing 90% right here, this is my 90% right there, which means there's 5% on both ends. Your Z star is 1.645. Or sometimes they give it to you uh, if they give you the confidence levels um, at the bottom down there. Let's see. Yeah, uh, confidence level C. Uh, they'll give that to you. So you can just look up the 90% and you get the 1.645. Anyways, that's what goes right there. Uh, the 2.86 goes right there. Okay, the standard deviation, uh, 0.78 goes there. And then we're going to square root of 15 goes on the bottom right there. So if you do all that correctly, you should get uh, choice D on that, you guys. So uh, in, the, in your calculator, uh, you can do this really easy by just going to stat and then test. And then uh, mine was number 7. So... So when you put out all the data, make sure you press in stats first, okay? And then that should get it to you, so no problem, okay? According to uh, one poll, only 8% of the public say they trust Congress. Well, that means 92% of the people don't trust Congress, okay? So in an SRS of 10 people, what's the probability that at least one person trusts Congress? Well, that's the same as um, uh, the complement, which is 1 minus the probability that none trust Congress. So if 8% say they trust Congress, Congress, then 92% uh, say they don't trust Congress. So uh, I'm going to put in 92% uh, right here, 0.92. And since we're doing 10 of them, it's going to be to the 10th power right there. So it's 1 minus 0.92 to the 10th. Okay, and you get choice D on that. Okay, easy enough. All right, in order to fairly set uh, flat rates for auto mechanics, a shop foreman needs to estimate the average time it takes to replace a fuel pump in a car. How large a sample must he select if he wants to be 99% confident that the true average time is within 15 minutes of the sample average? Assume that the standard deviation of all times is 30 minutes. Okay, since they gave me the standard deviation, we're going to go ahead and uh, use this formula right here. The standard, uh, your Z star, so for 99% times your standard deviation divided by the square root of N. We're looking for N, and it's going to be less than or equal to our desired outcome. So in this case, our desired outcome is less than or equal to 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, at the 99% confidence interval, my Z score is, uh, score is 2.576, and then we're just going to plug it in. So... Uh, 30 is uh, my standard deviation divided by the square root of n less than or equal to 15. So we go ahead and cross multiply and square both sides and we get 26.54. has to be greater than that, so it's choice A. Okay, easy enough. All right, so this ringing a bell, you guys. So it's been a couple of months since I had you in class. Okay, the mean age of a bus driver in Chicago is 53.4 years. If the hypothesis test is performed, if a hypothesis test is performed, how should you interpret a decision a decision that rejects the null hypotheses? Okay, so if it rejects the null hypotheses, our, our uh, result should be, um, uh, let's see, it's this one right here. There is sufficient evidence to reject the claim that uh, it's equal to 53.4. So you'll do some calculations and it'll give you sufficient evidence or significant evidence, we called it, um, uh, to reject our claim that, it, with that your mu is equal to that. So it's choice B on this one. So there is not sufficient evidence. No, that, would be, that wouldn't be that. There is sufficient evidence to support the claim. No, it says this. How should you interpret a decision to, that rejects the null hypothesis? So we would interpret it by saying this. There is sufficient evidence to reject the claim that it equals 53.4. Okay, so, so B. All right. Okay, so if the probability of A is 0.25 and the probability of B is 0.34, what is the probability of A union B if A and B are independent? Okay, if, well, if they're independent, you guys, then remember this formula. A union B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersection B. Remember, you had, if we, I, wish I, I wish I drew that on here. If we had two circles that overlapped and they had that little middle piece right here, that little middle piece was this part right here. So when you add this circle A and you add this circle B, the middle piece gets counted twice, you guys. So, 
So you have to subtract it out once. So that's why this formula is right here. So we're going to plug in 0.25 there, 0.34 there, and then this is going to be the product of those two right there. So, so we get uh, choice B on that. Okay. All right. So a significance test gives a p-value of 0.04. From this we can, um, okay, which is, um, this is 4%, remember, you move the decimal over two places, it's 4%, so can we reject it at the 1% level? No. Can we reject it at the 5% level? Yes. Can we say the probability of HO is false at the 4%? That doesn't make too much sense, not, not in our statistical language. Say the probability that HO is true at the, the same thing, that doesn't make sense. So it's choice B on that one, you guys, okay? All right, so... Uh, what is the critical T value for finding a 96% confidence interval estimate from a sample of 18 observations? All right, remember, I don't have this one. I wish I'd have drawn that too. If I drew the bell shaped curve, you guys, and 96% was in the middle, they would have 2% on each side because there's 4% left over. So, so with 18, uh, your degrees of freedom is 18 minus 1, which is 17. And so 2% uh, on each tail. So I'm going to look on my T table at 2% on each tail, you guys. So here's my T distribution. I'm going to go down to my degrees of freedom of 17. And I'm going to go over here at the 2%. And where those guys line up, that would be my T score right there. So that one right there, 2.224. Okay, so that would have been choice D. Okay. And remember, they'll give you all these tables, you guys. They'll give them all to you. You get a whole packet of them. You just got to know how to use them all, you guys. Okay, so um, uh, I noticed our, our TI-83s doesn't have this function, but the 84s do or the silver editions do. So if you go under uh, the second function, VARS distribution, at least I didn't see it in the 83s, you guys. Maybe you can find it. You look for um, uh, inverse T. So when you plug in uh, 98, 17, it'll give you that right there. So... Boy, if you can find it in the TI-83, I'd, I'd be stoked if you can uh, email that to me. That would be cool. All right, so which of the following would uh, results uh, would give you the widest confidence interval? Okay, a small sample size of 95% confidence. Okay, the widest confidence interval. We want smaller sample sizes. That gives us wider confidence intervals. And the bigger the, the percentage of confidence intervals, the wider they're going to be. So small sample size, okay, I like that. If I want it to be the widest, I want small sample size, 95% confidence interval. Small sample size, 99% confidence interval. This one's wider than this one right here. Larger samples makes um, uh, not as wide confidence intervals, okay? So C and D are not it. So it's going to be choice B on here, okay? So, so basically, you guys, this explains the reason why. Smaller sample sizes, uh, so... So our standard deviation over the square root of n is large and greater confidence intervals. Uh, so the critical z's ends up being large, or t's, depending on if they give you the standard deviation or not. Uh, z if, it, if they do, and t if they don't. Uh, they both result in wider intervals. So basically, you guys, smaller sample sizes makes it wider, and 99% confidence interval is going to make it even wider. Okay, so a highway superintendent uh, states that five bridges into a city are used in the ratio of two to three to three to four during the morning rush hour. Okay, this right here smells to me like chi squared goodness of fit right there. A highway study of an SRS of 6,000 cars indicates, yep, see here's, here's the observed values right here, 920, 1,570, 1,480 and 2,030 cars used on the five bridges respectively. Okay, these are the observed. So can the superintendent claim that by rejecting at, um, at the 1 or 5% level of significance? Okay, so what we need to do is get our expected counts. Okay, so if I add these up, 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4, that equals 12. Let's see what I talk about here. Okay, so here's how we do uh, chi-squared goodness of fit, you guys. We've got to find the sum of the observed counts minus the expected count squared divided by the expected counts right here. Okay, um, so... So we have um, uh, 12 total uh, uh, ways, you guys. So the expected numbers are going to be um, uh, 2 out of 12 times 6,000, 3 out of 12, because here's 2 out of 12, 3 out of 12, okay, and another 3 out of 12. I don't need to do it twice. So these are going to be my expected counts. And then finally, 4 out of 12. So 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000 are my expected counts, okay? So remember, observe minus the expected. So to get our chi-squared goodness of fit, Okay, so here's my observed count minus the expected squared divided by the expected. 
observed count minus the expected squared divided by the expected and so on okay so here's my chi squared 10.38 okay now since uh, we had four different uh, uh, bridges you guys and the degrees of freedom is four minus one or three so we look up the p value on the chi squared uh, uh, thing okay and then um, uh, and then we plug in chi squared um, uh, in our calculator 10.38 and we punch in a thousand, you guys, because we want to we, uh, we want to go to the right, right there. So we're asking for the area between the chi squared and a very large number. Think of the you know the bell-shaped curve where we want to go the very large number. Your chi squared and this very large number. So I plugged in a thousand right there. So it'll take me way out here to a thousand. That just ensures 500 would have worked, probably 300 would have worked, but a thousand definitely works. Okay, and then comma three for degrees of freedom, and I get uh, 0.0. 0156. Okay, so that is between 1 and 2 percent right there. So which one was it between uh, 1 and 2 percent? Okay, so it's sufficient evidence to reject the claim at the 5 percent level, but not the 1 percent level. Okay, all right, and then uh, whoops, so let me go backwards here, you guys. So in your TI 83s or 84s, you put them in list one, your observed counts in list two, your expected counts, and then go down to your chi squared goodness of fits. Okay, and, and you should get the same results right there. Okay. All right, so uh, a school superintendent wants to know what percent of the property owners are willing to support an increase in school taxes. So what's the sample size should, uh, to obtain with a 90% confidence interval to support the level within 5%? Okay, so remember, here's our sample size calculation. So our Z scores and then our proportions divided by the square root of N. Proportion times 1 minus proportion. Now, they didn't give that to us, so do you remember what we put in here if they don't give it to us? We put 0.5 in for those guys right there, and then less than or equal to my margin of error, which in this case is 0.05. Okay, 90% confidence interval, I get a z-score of 1.645. Okay, and they didn't give us our proportion, so we're going to use 0.5, so that's going to give us that. So, um, uh, and I get, um, I get choice C on that one. Okay, all right, take care, you guys.